Please do not harass or attempt to intimidate any users featured in this video. Ponder Sprocket commentaries are intended as critiques of situations of behaviors based on the information available and are meant to demonstrate wrongdoings, contradictions, or dispel false narratives so that others may come to an informed opinion. Under no circumstances is targeted harassment appropriate or encouraged. This video makes mention of and may discuss and display artwork featuring uncomfortable themes such as domestic abuse, self-harm, mental health, toxic relationships, animal abuse, as well as allusions to predatory behavior and inappropriate depictions of fictional characters. Viewer discretion is advised. Alright, and now that the YouTube bots have completely demonetized me, let's begin. Why can't people ever listen? Why does it seem like even if you tell people the issues at hand, they'll still go ahead with whatever brain-dead idea they'd come to you about earlier, whether out of spite or stupidity? Because it's definitely starting to seem like that. Hey, I'm Ponder Sprocket, and on today's docket, welcome to my living hell. So some people might not know this, but there are a lot more situations discussed behind the scenes of these videos, rather than within in the videos themselves. And this is mostly from people just coming to B's social medias, asking for advice, or trying to get my perspective on a situation. I get messages about topics people think I could make a video out of, people sending me videos they think would be good commentary material, and, as with today's example, people trying to entice me into making a video to expose a problematic person. Usually an artist, if I'll be honest. Obviously, if there's an issue with the information I'm being presented, the messenger tends to receive back a note about this, very often explaining at least to a degree why it's questionable or lacking. Now, you would think that if it was explained to someone making a call out like this that their evidence of someone producing illegal content didn't actually prove their narrative, they might reassess the evidence at hand. You would think that if it were explained that these unsubstantiated accusations may have inadvertently been blaming a victim for their abuse, they might take a step back to reevaluate the situation. You would also think that this being explained by someone that this person was confident would would, quote, look into this issue that has been glossed over for a few years, and then, as a result, admitting that regarding the provided evidence they, quote, didn't have the context behind a lot of them, would recognize that the argument being provided is flawed. You might even think that they would be more likely to remove the video if they had apologized for the mistake and said that they would do so. And lo, you might think that they would have no reason to later create two more declarations about these accusations and the accused justifying themselves spreading it around. Oh, but you would be wrong. Meet Kaimurama. Back in October 2019, Kaimurama sent B a message on DeviantArt from what I assume to have been either a banned or since abandoned account. Their concerns were with regards to an artist named Dolly Guts or Tirza, whom I will be nicknaming T because it's easier, specifically noting that the artist had produced quote unquote problematic content and that there may have been issues with harassment. It took me all of 30 seconds to not like the video she sent me. It's fucking rough. Initially, B sent a message back pointing out a good chunk, but not all, of the problems with the claims as they were presented, ending off by pointing out that if I were going to make a video about the situation, it would be including the video I was sent, and that if the uploader still had any concerns regarding, I'ma be real with you, literally the only accusation with some merit of weight, and I'm using weight extremely liberally here, then they could create a revised version of the video focusing on that aspect and their personal experiences alone. I had many, many issues with what was in that video, some of which I didn't even realize at the time. Kamarama sent a message back saying that they apologized for the bother and would be taking the video down. Situation solved, right? Everything's good. <laughs> because recently I ended up getting messages from people concerned about a drama surrounding Dolly Guts that they wanted me to look into. I thought the name sounded a tad familiar, only for me to click on the provided link and lo and behold, it was the same video that Kaimurama had made and sent me eight months prior. I tried to give the benefit of the doubt thinking this might be a re-upload, but after checking Kaimurama's original message to me, I was really annoyed to discover that it was the exact same video. According to Kaimurama themselves, the whole point of coming to me was to to get me to look into the situation. But if in doing that, it's told to you that the evidence is flawed and the concept victim blaming, you're just going to ignore it? Why try to get into contact with me to check over things if you're not actually concerned whether or not the information you're providing is right? I don't know about you guys, but to me, that sounds like Kaimurama never gave two shits whether the accusations within the video were true or not. They either just wanted me to make a video further berating this artist or else justify Kaimurama's own actions, which I wasn't willing to do. I even left a comment on Kaimurama 
Thomas Third video, but magically, when I went back to check, not only was my comment gone, but so was the original video. And then when B asked Kamarama about it on DeviantArt and made note that, yeah, I was gonna be doing a commentary on it, uh, she used the block button and then removed all of the videos and then deactivated her account. Hmm. Fishy fishy! It almost looks like my comment pointing out that Kaimurama knew the video had flaws specifically was an issue, and if the video had problems enough to warrant being taken down, problems that you knew about, why wasn't it done earlier? So Kaimurama, here's the result of that choice. Today we'll be looking at three videos from Kaimurama, the first video from October of 2019, a video doubling down on the first released in April of 2020, and an even more recent video released in May of 2020. Originally I just wanted to focus on these three videos, but in looking into this situation further, I recognized a second party who is just as, if not more culpable in the spread of these accusations, and overall I feel it would be detrimental to not bring them up as well. Start! Hi, it's Meg. I want to begin by saying this video is not to be taken as a joke, and that the things mentioned are disgusting. Trigger warnings for self-harm, pedophilia, abuse, and the romanticism of such. You have been warned. Yeah, that second one? You wanna guess why that video having still been up despite Kaimurama knowing that some of the information is false is a heckin' problem? If you've been following my art for a long time, you probably notice a huge style change during 2018. I'll be explaining why that happened in the first place and why the user that is being talked about in this video should be avoided and should not be supported whatsoever. During 2016, I stumbled across an artist by the name of Dolly Guts on Instagram. At first glance, they seemed like a pastel goth artist who had an interesting way of over-exaggerating their characters and using pale colors to make their work appealing. I found their way of drawing fascinating and decided to take many aspects of their work into my own, including designing new OCs that resembled their style and aesthetics. I drew like that for two years, and even now I have a habit of drawing similarly because of that. But the important thing to take note of is why I stopped supporting them. I created my character Kira Bexley on December 31st of 2016. I tried my best at the time to replicate the style that Dolly Guts was using because I liked how it looked and I wanted that for my own art. After Kira's creation, I became obsessed with drawing her. I would draw her every day if I could. I loved her a lot and I put a lot of myself into that character. She was very personal to me and was a comfort character whenever I felt challenged or overwhelmed. At one point, I also decided to make fan art for Dolly Guts one of which was of their OC Ash with mine, Kira, and a few others at the time. They took notice of it and thanked me for the fan art. I was ecstatic. I was noticed by somebody I looked up to and I continued to draw for them. And at one point they followed me back. We would talk a bit on Twitter and even send notes back and forth on DeviantArt when I had the time. I considered us friends and I believe that they thought the same. I even commissioned them to draw Kira twice. However, things started to change. They have sold adoptables before, and in March of 2018 it started up again. And it didn't seem like much of an issue at, at the time, but that was before I saw these designs. The first one looks a lot like Kira. I wanted to ignore it, so I did, and that was my own mistake. I can see the resemblance now, but at the time I didn't want our friendship to end, so I ignored it. Okay, so I know that was a long stint with no cuts, but this is the first thing that we need to talk about, and my interjection is three pages long, so it evens out. There are two things that T is being accused of where it's very obvious that these are actually things that they have done. Copying Stop. of other people's characters and the selling them as adoptables is one of them. However, this is also the first thing I have an issue with, specifically because of the person making this claim and, later on, the nature of the characters T is being publicly accused of stealing designs from. Look at these characters. Characters. Now, from a first glance, you might agree that these characters look very similar and that it's clearly a ripoff. I contest this accusation, however. The reason I contest this is because this image of the character of Kira that Kaimurama is bringing up was drawn by T. The white dress that this character is featured in is not actually a part of the character's general overall design. It was something that she was either requested to be drawn in or which T chose to draw her in, which means that it is not a part of the character's typical design elements. This is important because it's those typical design elements that T is being accused of ripping off. The main visual elements for Kaimurama's character Kira then are short fluffy hair with horn-like tufts on top featuring a lilac and pink gradient, pink upwardly turned horns, pink eyes, brown skin, long elf-like ears, ear piercings, and a pink demon tail with a heart point at its tip. T 
T's character design shares aspects of Kira's design, there's no arguing that, but it's a matter of how many elements are shared that determines whether something is a ripoff or whether it's drawing too much inspiration from its source. It's true that T's character shares the hair, horns, and skin, but it equally differs on just as many aspects. In my opinion, the hair is the greatest defender in this, being noticeably similar to Kaimurama's design, as well as sharing a purple and pink gradient, though T's character gradient seems to be much lighter and the pink seems to taper off into a yellowish tone. As a contrast, T's character's horns are purple, curved, and are turned downward, while Kira's are growing straight upward. The character's eyes are also purple, and the character's skin seems to be lighter than that of Kira. So that's one aspect that is very obviously lifted, and two aspects that have potentially been inspired, but are clearly visually different. Nothing else about the character's design is actually the same. The white dress that they are both featured in during Kaimurama's example, not only being completely different dress designs, is not a part of Kira's design, and therein the similarity is moot. The reason that image is showcased here is to further demonstrate a comparison between it and T's character. Except if Kaimurama used a different picture, such as any of the ones they had showcased before, then the comparison would not be as cut and dry, especially if they had used two of the images where Kira's hair is styled completely differently. It would simply look like two similarly designed characters. T's character does not have the long elf-like ears. In fact, there are no ears showcased at all. They don't have the piercings, they don't have the demon tail. Meaning that out of these seven visual design elements included in Kira's design, in T's character, four of them are unused, eye color, ears, piercing, and tail. Two of them are inspired but altered, horns and skin tone, and one of them is a direct copy minus slight color alterations, the hair. If you haven't figured it out yet, that doesn't inherently mean that the character is a ripoff. Could the character have been inspired by Kira? Of course, I'm not gonna deny that. It's entirely possible, and frankly, I think it's likely. I think that T was commissioned this piece, liked the look of the character in the white dress, and decided that they wanted to make a character that looked similar. But it's certainly not a ripoff like it's being claimed here. Inspiration is not a crime, and that is a topic I'll be bringing up again later, trust me, just as taking a few elements from a character you enjoy the design of is not a crime. I demonstrated this in my Sashley video where I showcased a character character design my artist made that took inspiration from design elements from a slew of other characters, but which when combined together created something new that didn't serve as a ripoff. My mentioning the inspirations being drawn from does not inherently mean that the character design was a ripoff of those inspirations, because it was so vastly different in comparison and drew from so many sources. Artists are allowed to do this, and this is clearly what T has done. I would also like to point out that there is absolutely no time frame set for when T's character was made versus when Kira was made meaning we cannot actually tell which one was made first, and the knowledge of that determines who might have taken inspiration from whom. We know that a version of Kira was created in 2016, but that version was clearly not the finished character, as they ended up getting horns and a tail later on. Even then, when did that change occur? That still begs the question as to when T's character was made. Could you at least provide us a few dates? It really shouldn't be difficult. Now, I would like to bring up that other characters from other artists have been showcased to have had the designs copied by T, and at least one of those claims holds far more weight than this comparison Kaimurama is bringing up. Kaimurama, however, did not talk about those other characters or artists here, and this was the only example they chose to provide. Obviously, this was because it was Kaimurama's character, and they are, as they have already explained, emotionally attached to it. But that doesn't change the fact that there were not only better examples to use, but the fact that the character Kaimurama did choose to use as an example could have the similarity be classified as inspiration at best. Being inspired by someone's character and creating Creating something similar is something that all artists who create characters do and have done in the past. My artist has done it, my friends have done it, people I admired when I was younger did it, future artists will do it, companies do this for various reasons, whether that be to tell a story with substitutes for copyrighted but socially recognized characters, satire, etc. T is clearly doing it or has done it before. This drawing of inspiration only becomes an issue when too much inspiration is drawn from a singular or maybe sometimes dual sources, really depends. As I've stated, there are clearly examples where T has done just that. This is just not one of them. I'd also like to further point out this line. I tried my best at the time to replicate the style that Dolly Guts was using because I liked how it looked and I wanted that for my own art. So you blatantly acknowledge that you had been using T's artwork as inspiration in the past, but now that T has used one element of one of your characters and two altered design aspects of that same character, it's a bad thing and T needs to be called out. But I took inspiration from T's artwork, not that character! Well that would be all fine and dandy where the majority of T's artwork specifically related to and revolving 
getting around the nature of the portrayal behind the character in question, T almost exclusively draws one character, that being the Ash character featured in most of their artwork, and this character is one that, and we'll discuss this a little more in depth later on, T has gone on record saying is an artistic version of themselves and is very important to them, a perspective that you also share with Kira. I loved her a lot, and I put a lot of myself into that character. She was very personal to me, and was a comfort character whenever I felt challenged or overwhelmed. So the inspiration you are drawing from is mostly centered around artwork of that character, Ash. I can see that you have taken inspiration in the form of the fluffy hair, the overly exaggerated eyelashes, the small and pouty lips, and the equally overly exaggerated hips, all of which have been incorporated into your character design, Kira, and all of which were design elements of Ash long before Kira was made. You see why I'm not particularly satisfied with the character you've used as an example of character design theft? If anything, your character, Kira, takes inspiration from more design elements seen in T's character Ash, then T's adoptable takes from your character Kira. Yes, T has actively lifted character designs from other artists to such a degree that it's clearly them repurposing and claiming the character design as their own. I will not argue that. Yours is not an example of that. As a further example, for Mermaid, my artist created a brown-skinned pastel mermaid with fluffy hair, with a gradient that included pink on top, had a small pouty mouth, big purple eyes, and a pink and purple gradient on the tail. It features almost as many shared design elements as both characters here, but is clearly different. The other artists who had the entirety of their character designs lifted have a much better case against T in this instance, whereas yours is debatable at best. You should have focused focused on those much clearer instances. I get that the character is special to you, but at least recognize that it's not as solid as you seem to view it, and there are not really a damning offense. At most, it should have been included as a, hey, I know it's not as big as the others, but I'm personally kind of miffed about this one, at the end after you'd already discussed the others. And considering the original message sent back to you indicated that if you wanted to continue forward with a claim that you actually had some sort of evidence-based reasoning behind, it should have been this one, and it should have been expanded upon. Good job on not improving upon the only thing that even tangentially holds water in this video. Sometimes characters look similar. Sometimes people take inspiration from you. Get over it. It was stupid of me. I didn't want to cause drama with someone I looked up to, so I did. Even some of my closest friends pointed it out to me and I still ignored the red flags. I continued being buddy-buddy with them. That was until at one point everything fucking clicked. A friend of mine warned me of things they did in the past, the things they do now, the way they draw their characters, the way they steal designs and everything just snapped. I don't even remember what caused it. I just remember that whatever it was, I knew I had to disassociate myself with them. So I did. Yeah, how's that working out for you? What with you being here, having made the video, attaching your name to T through allegations that you can't substantiate and were told you couldn't substantiate? Great social distancing there, Kaimurama. I made a story on Instagram explaining to the followers of Mutuals that I had to end things with them. That the things they did didn't sit right with me, and I would rather be independent. However, things didn't end there. Their girlfriend, Bailey, started harassing me on Instagram, sending memes and messages that basically screamed, We trusted you. You shouldn't have done any of this. You were dead to me. Etc. Notice how what we're looking at is a black screen. Mind you, the screen isn't going to stay black. No, no. Kaimurama will eventually give us some screenshots, but we never get screenshots of this claim. I ended up blocking them, and when I went back to recently unblock them, it seems that the account they had was deactivated and I cannot retrieve the DMs between us. How convenient. You do realize that this means you don't get to make the claim paired with the emotional pleas that you're doing now, right? This whole, they were so mean to me and I didn't realize until I put my foot down and they harassed me for it, is you exclusively appealing to your audience's emotions. You have nothing to prove that what you're saying is real and so we have no reason to believe it. Do I personally think that it happened? Yeah, I think it's possible. I've seen enough of Bailey's gross behavior that I would not be surprised if that was exactly what they did. There's still four problems with that, however. One, just because I give you more leeway because I've gone over so much of this and I've seen how awful Bailey can be, it doesn't mean that you get to make this claim without evidence. That's not how this works. Sure, it could be potentially more believable, but that doesn't mean that it happened. Equally, that doesn't mean that you can deal this out to your audience without giving them evidence of what you're claiming. And considering one of your main complaints against T is going to be instances 
charges of harassment, you don't just get to tack this on top of that without an ability to prove it. You're tainting the well you haven't even started giving us water from by appealing to emotions. We've seen this before and it ain't kosher. Two, you can talk about your emotions as a result of the interactions and therein explain why the situation felt off-putting to you, and that would be perfectly fine. But this video was centered around trying to make an argument proving that the subject in question was bad to some degree and had to change the nature of their artwork. There's a huge difference between explaining your tumultuous past with a person and how it made you feel versus making an argument to prove past events that you were overall not present for that imply T to have nefarious or else ill-conceived motives. Three, I want to point out that Kaimurama said, Their girlfriend, Bailey, started harassing me on Instagram, sending memes and messages that basically screamed, We trusted you. You shouldn't have done any of this. You were dead to me. Etc. The messages basically screamed that, huh? So this was not exactly what the messages said. Are you saying that this is your interpretation of the intentions behind the messages? Messages that you haven't and apparently can't show us? So rather than relay the messages as they were directly written, this poisoning of the well is furthered by you providing what you've just indicated to potentially be your interpretation of events and not the literal events as they took place. Okay. For what Bailey did is not T's fault. You said but Bailey was harassing you. Bailey was sending you mean messages. You made no mention that you ever told T that this was happening, nor have you given any indication that T was aware of Bailey's actions. Did you do that? Did you not? We don't know. You do not get to blame someone for the actions of their significant other if you cannot prove that they had any involvement or knowledge of them. You, your husband killed this woman? Guess you're going to jail too. I logged onto Discord to talk to my friends about the situation later that day and received a message from T themselves telling me to never talk to them and their friends again. Which did hurt. I was friends with a lot of their friends at the time and after this happened all of them just broke away and didn't interact with me anymore. Okay, see, now we got to the point where I have to be annoyed that what Kaimurama posted on Instagram hasn't been shown. We don't know how you publicly called T out on there, or whether or not you mentioned what these supposed things that T had done that you couldn't stand behind were. Even then, whichever one it was, you're still being ridiculous. If you publicly made note of these accusations on your Instagram, then those who run in T's circle would have every reason to distance themselves from you. They and T are still friends, and you would have just written this about one of their friends. And if it was anything like this video, I don't really have high hopes for how accurately informative it was. Of course they're not going to want to associate with you. If you didn't publicly make note of what you believe T to have done and simply said that T had done things that you couldn't tolerate, they're still allowed to not like you and distance themselves from you. I can't even be sure which one is worse. On the one hand, if you talked about this stuff publicly, I mean, come on, I'm doing a commentary of the summation of your claims, I think that should be an indicator of my opinion of their effectiveness. Which which you were aware of considering you were told about these concerns in October. On the other hand, if you didn't specify, then that leaves so much room for people to speculate about what T did and exactly how bad what they did had to have been for you to not want anything to do with them anymore. The fact that you're bringing this up again by appealing to emotions despite it being, I would think, common knowledge that if you say that someone in a friend group did something horrible that you don't have the ability to concretely prove, yeah, that's going to make the people who are also their friend not want to be your friend. That's like the main way that friend groups split. They take sides in feuds. Why are you shocked by this? I don't just get to go on Instagram and be all sorry guys, but I can't tolerate Icy Hazard's behavior anymore. There's just too much she's done behind the scenes that I just can't support. And I'm choosing to distance myself from her and this gross behavior. And then be fucking shocked when all of our shared friends get mad at me. This is an obvious consequence of your actions, but we're still supposed to feel bad because, oh, it hurt. On top of that, if you believed at the time that T was proper guilty of everything you were going to be talking about here, and you distanced yourself because you couldn't tolerate it, why would you be upset if other people who clearly did tolerate it didn't want anything to do with you? Isn't that like the exact thing you were trying to accomplish by distancing yourself from T? Keeping yourself away from the people who thought this stuff was okay? This pity party stuff doesn't work here. I felt extremely depressed and anxious after all of this. And a few months later, I forced myself to pick up a different style of drawing to prevent myself from thinking about them. It's been a year, and even now, when I still think of them, I feel sick. I feel ill even writing this script and reading it out loud. The thought of them makes me feel actual dread, but I didn't want to just sit around and do nothing with the evidence that was compiled over the years and let them go to waste. 
This whole thing really only works if you don't take both sides into consideration. Look, no sarcasm here. I empathize with you losing your friends. I understand that something like that would hurt and make someone feel as though they were betrayed. What I want to point out here, however, is that this justification for you feeling hurt because of this situation only works if you are right. Think about it. If Kaimurama's public claim regarding T was right, then she becomes a martyr, abandoned by friends who refused to open their eyes to the horrible things that T had done, cast out, harassed, and then blacklisted from the friend group. However, if Kaimurama's claims are wrong, then Kaimurama has no real ground on which to stand to complain about being shunned. Because in that scenario, Kaimurama would be the villain. From the other side of the situation, i.e. from the perspective of the people that Kaimurama was going up against, Kaimurama would have been the one to call out one of their friends publicly, potentially either with lackluster evidence or nothing substantial to support the claims being made. You really expect any of them to be okay with that? This whole feel bad for me, my friends cut me off, only works if you are right, and you have so far failed to demonstrate that you are right. The screenshots I'm about to show you are not taken by me, but rather taken from various sites and people that have had their own run-in with them. I'll leave the links to the sites below and try to explain everything I can with the context given. Yeah, I'm just uh, gonna mention what those links were now. The first was the Tumblr link leading to a callout post. That is where the majority of the evidence that will be used against T was from. The second and third were links to lolcow forums and Kiwi Farms, respectively. Kiwi Farms was removed because T was doxxed on that forum, but as far as I'm aware, the lolcow thread doxxed them too, so... And yeah, we're going to be having a, a lot of problem with those links, I promise you that. Everything started with a person going by M at the time. M and T, aka delegates or tears of, I don't give a fuck about what they go by nowadays, were in a relationship. M was very passionate about their OCs and story and would talk to T about it frequently. At one point, T had voiced their jealousy to M about their OCs and story and wished that they had the same thing. I suppose T got tired of complaining and just turned to forcing M to make them a story for them, threatening self-harm and suicide if they didn't. Finally, we move on to some actual screenshots! Too bad they suck! Let's go over this first one. You mention all these stories you have, but I don't even have one. I'm jealous and it makes me really, really sad. Is that why you push me out of the way? Yes, I just wanted to be able to do that too. Like, when you wanted to talk about OC stuff together. Like that. What even is this? No, really, what do you think this proves? That T was jealous? Because it doesn't. You'll notice that there are no visible names in this screenshot, so how are we supposed to know that this was a conversation between M and T? Because M says so? Who the heck is M and why should we trust them? Why do you trust them? At least if you knew them personally and could perhaps vouch for them as a friend or a colleague, then we might have some sort of idea as to why you specifically have trust in this source, but as far as I've been able to understand, you don't have any sort of relationship with M to speak of. On top of that, why does this then segue into the second image, which, while being a screenshot from a conversation, is clearly not the same conversation? They're also gotten mad at M for having so many OC stories and demanded M make them one, and literally had threatened to hurt themselves unless he came up with something for them. This is testimony! This isn't even testimony given by by M. This is someone else recounting what they claim M said happened. Why do you think that proving that someone, not T, because you didn't prove that, being jealous that maybe M has, what, I don't know, better OCs, more developed, prettier, it's literally never specified, means that this testimony given by some fucking rando we don't even know the identity of, because again, no name, is real. This is someone showing a screenshot of a conversation that is potentially not related to and not even said by the two people claiming to be in it as a means of proving that someone else's testimony of a more socially serious offense is true. Congratulations, call Kaimurama Mr. Fantastic because boy, if that isn't a stretch. I'm not sure if I'm even obligated to do so, but even if they did, T didn't stop there. I straight up don't know this thing about the story I'm telling. Eh, it's not like you've actually proper known about anything else in this video, so. They started changing their OCs dramatically to match with M's, and justified it with simply, I want to. Whenever M would bring it up to T about how similarly their characters were becoming, T would threaten suicide if they didn't stop bothering them about it. Mother 
motherfucker just pulled the same damn thing. Screenshot a conversation allegedly between M and T, but with no names provided. Yes, one could infer that it's T because of the mention of T's characters Ash and Elliot, but it could just as easily be someone making fan art or someone pretending to be T to fake this conversation. Followed by literal high school gossip. That's not even the only issue I have with this point, but I'll get to that one a little more in depth as we go on. This continued until M broke it off. After that, T apparently accused M of being an abusive partner, despite the things they've done, and because of their popularity, won that claim, and M eventually had to move on and change their username and art style to avoid her further harassment. You know, regarding whoever put together all of these screenshots originally, or else regarding M since they're the ones allegedly recounting this, um, why do we have absolutely no screenshots of T harassing M? Are we expected to believe that M was able to get poorly cropped screenshots from some of their conversations with T, but didn't screenshot any of the harassment? harassment they claim T directed towards them? From what is implied in the screenshots, the two interacted in private conversations. Did the harassment happen there? If we assume M could get screenshots of T allegedly being jealous of their character, why could they not get screenshots of the harassment? This is being phrased as though T made a public statement calling M out for being an abuser, they're indirecting harassment towards them, but if that were the case, where is it? Oh, check the description! It's in my resources! No, it's bloody not! It's not on the original Tumblr blog, it's not within the first culinary post for the Kiwi Farms or Lol Cow forums, and I shouldn't have to scroll through 400 odd pages of faceless tryhards endlessly talking about how bad Tears' art is. My god, guys, we get it! In order to find something to justify these garbage screenshots. You're willing to attempt to prove that T said they were jealous of someone's characters, but not that they were harassing their X. My god, fix your priorities. Oh, and yeah, these are more hearsay. I care like 0% about these screenshots because they don't prove a thing. This is T's art before they took from M. Clarification! This is T's artwork from 2012. It's not like a person's work changes in the span of five years or anything. Oh, and how is that done? By taking in other inspiration and experiences? SHOCKING! Here is M's original character at the time. And here is what T created compared to M's work. Where are the time codes? Where is any sort of proof that this character existed beforehand? <coughs> Fine, I'll do your job for you. This is gonna be a long one. I scrolled through T's DeviantArt account until I was able to find a connection to this M person. That came in the form of an art trade, which then led me to the account, voila, M's account. Hi, cat shops. I checked just to confirm that there was, indeed, some sort of relationship with T back in 2014. The end of it all was posted January 27th, 2015. Blanc was posted July 19th, 2014. And Scary was posted August 23rd, 2014. And while not cited here, the Tumblr blog with the evidence that Kaimurama links to in the description also brings up this image titled A Baby, uploaded August 24th, 2014. The pieces of T's that are being compared are Tell Me You Love Me, posted on November 29th, 2014, Say Yes, posted on October 19th, 2014, and again within the Tumblr post, The Heart Thing, posted November 12th, 2014. Wow, that was so hard! Showing the timeframes for when the images were originally uploaded as a means of proving that one person's work was made after someone else's, rather than just saying it and expecting people to believe? What a novel concept! Dumb thing that I noticed though, uh, why is T being accused of directly lifting from artwork of a piece? That didn't exist at the time the artwork T is being accused of making as a result of that lifting was posted. This being posted in January 2015, whilst all of T's compared works here were from 2014. I know that the character is older, but the Tumblr has been comparing pieces that I assume they perceive to be indication that T was copying M. How can this piece have been one of the ones that T was copying from if it hadn't even been made yet? That seems like a really obvious oversight with the evidence, you know, aside from all of the other ones. On top of that, the character of Ash, the one being shown in these screenshots, the implication being that T's character changed into what they then became as a result of the interaction with and exposure to M and their character respectively, is shown in the Tumblr post in a screenshot that includes one of the character's original designs beside an image of M's character, and then an image of T's Ash character, presumably from around the time the post was made. Except this kind of 
ignores the fact that these two pieces were made over a year apart, and that the earlier design of Ash that they are bringing up, then named Aku, went through a series of design changes over that time and had already gone through a series of changes leading up to this point, mostly with regards to their gender and outward gender expression. This wasn't an immediate change, this was a series of design changes that were slowly added over the course of a year. Yes, this might be able to prove that this series of changes coincides with T and M's relationship, but this overall equally demonstrates the progression of T's art and how their style changed as a whole, likely as a result of their artistic interest shifting from more outwardly recognized gothic aesthetics to the doll-like Lolita and pastel goth look that T would have been exposed to as a result of being M's friend. Assuming that M was the first of the two to have that aesthetic interest, and I'm really only assuming that to give you the benefit of the doubt. What's that? Your artistic style and outward expression changes depending on the people you interact with, your role models, and what sorts of new cultures, styles, and interests you are exposed to? Preposterous. If I ever find out that there was some sort of bonding between these two regarding their love of this aesthetic, and yet M still thinks it's bad for T to demonstrate that interest in their art in the same vein that M demonstrates theirs, I think I would scream. Oh, and just to get really annoying, in February of 2014, this is what M's character looked like. And like this in March, it's arguably not until April that we see M's character wearing a dress akin to what T is being accused of stealing off of them. And even then, I don't think these are the same dress designs, I'm just trying to give some sort of leeway for interpretation. Except T had already drawn Ash in dresses akin to this back in January and March. So unless you can demonstrate that there's some massive chunk of art pieces missing from this timeline, it seems that these were already design choices that T had been exploring by the time M started implementing them into their own character's design. Boom! Maybe if you'd actually looked further into this situation, you'd have noticed that. Similarly, you might have noticed that each and every one of these pieces by T has a comment left on it by M! on Tell Me You Love Me, on Say Yes, and on The Heart Thing. I think what's further infuriating about this is that these are not the only comments by M on pieces of T's work that share in this developing art style. From this piece in April of 2014 to this one from May, this one from July 4th, July 20th, the 25th, August 7th, 27th, September, October, November, December. Tell me! How is it that T is supposed to know that it's bad for them to be adapting these traits into their work and character if they are receiving nothing but praise publicly from M, the person they are allegedly taking inspiration from as their art progresses in that direction? Oh, it's so bad that T was deriving inspiration from my artwork. Okay, so why did you then continuously tell them that you loved the pieces? Even if you lied about liking the pieces at the time, why do you think that means it's okay to vilify T for behavior that you were praising them for publicly? Is there, I don't know, maybe something to showcase that T was called out for this behavior by M? No, nothing of that sort for us to go off of? Great. Sorry guys, but I've been telling all of these YouTubers behind the scenes how you're all bad people for drawing me fan art. I know I've never said that I don't want fan art, and I even have a segment dedicated to it, but you should have just known that drawing my character was illegal, so we're all gonna block you now. Cheers! Even if stealing his style isn't an issue, this is clear evidence that T took from M's work and character, which is extremely ironic considering T hates it when people steal from them. Oh it is, is it? This is proof that T stole from M, huh? Okay, we'll play it your way. In that case, explain why an element that first showed up in T's artwork showed up in M's mere days later. Specifically, this design trait of the eye and eyelashes fully colored into one solid shape. That thing that was featured here, M's character has the same eye and eyelash design comprised entirely of one solid color. Oh, but that's strange. The earliest piece from M that I can find of them completely blotting out the eyes in this fashion is this piece from July 21st. Yet the earliest piece of tease that I can find doing this is from July 3rd, which I can prove that M saw. Even regarding the concept of the colored eyelashes, which both of them chose to use, the earliest piece I can find of tease that implements this technique is Boss from June 3rd, which M saw. And yet the earliest I can find this technique used in M's work is A Living Ghost, posted on June 24th. 
Now, there is a potential explanation for this that was expanded upon by M elsewhere. I want to make note of that, but for the sake of keeping things consistent for now, I'll focus only on what was available to be seen at the time of Kaimurama's video. I.e., uh, does Kaimurama's video prove this shit? The explanation as it's brought up will be included in a segment later on. That being said, if at the time this was Kaimurama demonstrating that T was stealing from M, then couldn't this mean that M had also been stealing from T? Or at the very least, they were either developing their art styles interconnectedly or were both quote-unquote stealing from the same tertiary artist they mutually followed, though it amounts to them still both doing the same thing. Oh, or, I don't know, maybe they were friends at the time and both of them were influencing the work of the other, as tends to happen. Also to be talked about later on, I was originally just guessing here, but yeah, they were friends at a time. If this is such a horrible thing that it can be tossed amidst the rest of these accusations and still be considered measured and deserved, then shouldn't M also be punished for this? Hey, Kaimurama, this is why the credibility of the accuser is important. We're gonna need to put that credibility in a porno because I just destroyed its gaping hole. Even if stealing his style isn't an issue, this is clear evidence that T took from M's work and a character, which is extremely ironic considering T hates it when people steal from them. And yet, once again, we don't get any screenshots to prove that. Lovely. Furthermore, you've just indicated that stealing a style, quote unquote, is potentially not an issue, but have also just spent the last minute of this video trying to convince us that T is vile for taking inspiration from M's work, despite M seemingly doing the very same thing. So the first thing presented here, outside of your own personal experiences, that T is being accused of potentially isn't a thing, because yeah, stealing an art style is not really a thing, but you're still trying to get on T's ass for taking inspiration? Are you fucking kidding me? You literally admitted at the beginning of this video that you were inspired by T's work and you'd alluded to you and T being friends, but now it's bad for T to take inspiration from one of their friends? You admitted you'd done the same thing. Even if you were able to prove that T had stolen these elements from M and therein needed to face the consequences, M potentially also did the same thing. So unless the three of you are going to be facing the same social punishment for all three of you committing the same social taboo, then shut your fucking mouth! Whenever someone takes an aspect of their art, they'll attack them and harass them until they change it or delete the work they posted. Oh goody! More screenshots! That was never my intention, and I have nothing against you, but that doesn't mean you own colors, speech bubbles, words, or pastel goth slash creepy cute themes. I certainly own my style that is a combination of those things that you have copied. Blow up at me again, and I'll call you up for doing what you've done. They unwatched me, so I don't care for name dropping them anymore. I may as well out them for taking my shit from me. You were very rude to me, and you did blow up at me. The apology was rude as fuck too. I'll leave you alone once you act decent for a change and apologize. I'm sorry alone would have done it, but you tried to guilt trip me instead. Just please leave me alone. I'm sorry, but just please leave me alone and never talk to me again. Whatever. Is your journal gone yet so I can delete mine? Wow, the very most that you might have been able to prove by this point is that T's a hypocrite. Simply the most outrageous and scandalous of crimes, especially considering everybody else in this situation seems to be one too. But whoops! I still have to point four things out. The first is, where is the rest of this conversation? This whole time you've been sitting here saying that T's the bad guy, whereas these screenshots are indicating that there was potentially not only some sort of blow up at T from this person, but also that there was apparently a journal and guilt tripping going on. None of which we get to see, of course, so all of that potential context is just gone. We literally can't even see the art piece in question, so we don't even know to what extent it was lifting from T's style. Granted, as an aside, while the concept of style theft as a whole is stupid, if whoever this person is was specifically trying to mimic T's style to the point that the pieces could be confused, resulting in revenue loss, T would have a reason to be upset about that. I doubt that actually happened, but it's always best to consider possibilities. Incorporating a single aspect is one thing, but mimicking a specific style with the intention to deceive, especially for monetary purposes, would be a legit problem. But was T mimicking M's style with the intention to deceive for monetary gain? No. At least show us the work so we can get even an inkling of an idea whether or not T had reason to be upset, even if their reaction wasn't appropriate. Although, that leads me to, where are the freaking dates? 
When did this happen? How old was T? Was this close to when the Tumblr blog was posted? Was it closer to when the video was posted? If this is something that happened when T was a teenager, then where's any indication that they currently still stand by this mentality as an adult? Thirdly, why the hell is your next point centered around vilifying T for being angry that people are allegedly copying their work when the point before had been vilifying T for taking inspiration from M's work? And I feel the need to note this because it's so insanely stupid. If it was bad for T to direct harassment towards people for copying their style, then why the fuck does M get a pass for doing that to T here? I mean, that's assuming M is the one who put this forward, and I'm assuming that to a degree because otherwise, where's the real connection to M in any of these screenshots? Yeah, you just forget that? This whole campaign is a means of claiming that T is evil for directing harassment at people for stealing their style, which hasn't been proven, but the campaign itself is geared towards ruining Tears' name, because they were taking inspiration from someone else's style. And yeah, T is being just as dumb as Kaimurama to be lashing out because someone took inspiration from their work or copied their style. Make no mistakes, if that is what's happening, then this is an example of Tirza being stupidly possessive over style traits that they cannot lay claim to. Kaimurama is right to make note that this is dumb. The problem is that Kaimurama just did the very same thing, where she tried to condemn Tirza for copying elements of someone else's style. If that isn't just some flaming spicy, spicy hypocrisy. hypocrisy. Of course I'm gonna point that out. Either it's a fucking problem and T's in the wrong for doing it, or it's not a fucking problem and you're all being whiny, insufferable morons complaining about people being inspired by your artwork, which last I checked, wasn't that supposed to be a compliment? You don't get to flip back and forth on whether this practice is okay, depending on which side T is standing on. Oh, and finally, if you don't think that you nor M need to be punished for taking inspiration from T, but still think that T should face the consequences of taking inspiration from M, then that would also make you a hypocrite, Kaimurama. Have fun with that. Listen, I'd be upset if someone decided to steal my character too but T literally took someone else's OC and claimed it to be theirs. Getting real sick of your inability to showcase what you're talking about, Kaimurama. Brace yourselves, guys. This is gonna be a long one. For everyone watching, whoop! This character created by Lime Fusion is one of the characters that T is being accused of lifting the design from. Her name is Ingrid and is by far the strongest case for this claim that I have seen. Yes, there are overall very few design elements to lift from, which ends up being T's downfall. Visually, the character is only comprised of white skin, pink hair done up in twin drills, pink eyes, very specific gothic attire. Tirza ended up creating Princess, which is, yeah, it's a blatant ripoff of Ingrid. There's really no getting around it. It's made worse if you consider that apparently when T originally posted Princess, they had pink hair. I won't deny or argue this. It's really obvious that T lifted the entire design from the character of Ingrid. This wasn't a case of T taking elements for inspiration to create something new. This was T taking all of the limited character design elements used in this character and not changing anything about them, taking anything away or adding anything, which ultimately results in the exact same design. It's super blatant and it's the strongest in that could be used to prove that T is too heavily reliant on drawing inspiration from the designs of others. But then we get to the rest of them. Mind you, there was no one easy place for me to find these character comparisons. Despite Kaimurama listing their resources, none of them actually easily compile these design lifting accusations in one place. Despite Kaimurama bringing it up in her video and listing these resources as though we should be able to find the exact same fucking accusations right amidst all the shitty evidence from the Tumblr blog. No, no, because that would be too fucking easy. This is what I was able to find by scrolling through the Kiwi Farms thread, as well as perusing the internet for any additional Tumblr blog callouts about Tirza. Other accusations of character lifting include, well, we've already seen the one from Kaimurama. There's also the claim that T's character Fen is ripoff or else inspired by Sleepy Kink's characters Mystery and Alfred, which even if the character was specifically inspired by these two, T has incorporated the elements of two different characters together to create one. That's not a bad thing to do. You know, provided you're not a complete dunce and don't just mash the two together like Sonichu. If anything, T would be diluting the pool of inspiration they're taking from by looking at multiple characters, which gives them more traits to draw from, which generally helps in avoiding having the character look like the characters used for inspiration. You could claim that this was a ripoff of Mystery and Alfred to the same degree that I could claim this was a ripoff of Shui Wamine from Hajifu Boyfriend. Crazy doctor, shoulder length brown hair, glasses, tie and dress shirt under lab coat, creepy ass smile. Seems like a cut and dry case if you ask me. Well, I guess mine is 
shoe's ponytail. Like, I kind of forgot he had that, honestly. Regardless, what I'm getting at is that this is stupid, mostly because these character designs are ridiculously simplistic. Minus myself looking at this and just thinking Fen looks like the shorter one, I'm assuming that's Alfred, but I could be very wrong. Realistically, you could take effectively any two characters that have similar traits to and were made before a single one being looked at and say that the single character was a ripoff because it shares traits with the others, as if visual or personality traits are completely unique to each and every person. Watch, I'll do it right now. Neolani, geez Mavi, more like Lexi Sprocket, am I right? Ponder, I have an entire cupboard of toys and I will subject you to them. Even Ingrid herself, which is the strongest example you have of T actually stealing someone's character design, just straight up looks like Black Lady from Sailor Moon, but without the dangly bits or sleeves. Find me a gothic artist that Lime Fusion, or Wicked, apparently that's their toy house username, follows, so I can arbitrarily draw a connection between Black Lady and a character from that artist to say Ingrid is a ripoff. Where is the evidence to establish a connection between T and these characters? Had T commented on these pieces? Were they following or friends with the artist who made them? Was there a similar issue that seemed to be happening with M where people were mutually taking inspiration from one another? Give me something! One of the blogs I found, titled Listen, I Just Want a Not Taken URL, talked about how they made an account on Toy House specifically with the intention of baiting T into stealing their characters. I don't really know how you do that, but okay. According to them, they posted these characters, and I do apologize for the low quality of the images. This is how they were uploaded to Tumblr, and there wasn't a higher resolution version available that I could find, named Minty, Osmond, and Kai. Also, according to them, within a few days, Tirza posted the characters September, Kotsia, and October Kotsia, which they state have similar designs, though not quite similar enough for them to concretely classify them as ripoffs. Boy, let's look at those designs. These are the designs for September and October, and these are the designs for Minty, Osmond, and Kai. Again, I apologize for the poor quality. I couldn't find any other images of these characters. Made more difficult that this person blots out their toy house name, so I can't go looking for the original toy house account, and the characters were allegedly made for the purpose of baiting tea, so I'm not exactly expecting to find a whole lot of images available. September apparently takes design inspiration from Minty because mint green hair, I guess. No, I'm serious. Aside from the fact that these characters are both gay women with green in their hair, they don't actually look anything alike. Minty's hair is divided almost down the middle with green and brown, whereas September's hair is almost entirely green, save for one tuft of black hair in the bangs. September also has glasses and clearly wears a different outfit, unfortunately only based on the stupid tiny reference for Minty that we were supposed to be working with. By that logic, B is just as much of a ripoff of Minty as September is. Hey! So the fact that T made a character with the color green in their hair, who was a gay woman, the latter being very in keeping with most of T's characters, that's a sign for us to be suspect. Were there other things copied from the character's bio? Well, that would seem weird since September and October have almost nothing in their bios and smart ass post maker here didn't screenshot any of that. Thanks. Then we've got October and Kai, and what similarities exist between these two? If you guessed literally just the skin color and their sexual attraction, then you'd be right! Kai is either some sort of furry or a dude with horns and elf ears, maybe, which October doesn't have. Kai seems to have no gender listed, whereas October is female. Kai has blue eyes, October has pink. Kai has emo cut white hair, October has a pixie cut mint green hair. And Kai's sclera is white, whereas October's is black. Remember, the person who put up this post claimed that the designs were similar. Frankly, I think that gives you an idea as to why this whole section around tea lifting designs is so flawed. People are looking for a ripoff in everything to the point where they are seeing similarities that barely exist. Then they post another character, this time named Milk Tea, whom they claim tea lifted the design from to create the character Shivana Pasha. Why? Because blonde hair, brown skin, and bang don't have the same hairstyle, aren't even the same nationality. But apparently, this three color similarity is concrete enough that the poster can say that T does, in fact, steal OCs. Only for them to call it inspiration later on in the same sentence. I can't even with this dumb shit. So, is it inspiration or is it stealing? One of them isn't an issue, so clarification on which of these it's actually supposed to be is kind of important because that determines whether or not T even did anything wrong. Am I saying that it's completely out of the realm of possibility that T saw and took inspiration from these character designs? No, not at all. But this? It's a combination of three colors on a female character, and it's not even a particularly unique color combination. 
Recovered from a secret vault under T's house, a photograph of Milk T and Shivana Pasha before their split in 1943, World War II colorized. What I am saying is that this is not evidence of T stealing someone else's design. Why? Because the character designs T is being accused of lifting in some of these instances are just the combination of colors is the same. Or even just one color is the same. Now, the Ingrid Princess thing does though. Make no doubt about that. The hair on that one is pretty pretty irregular and it helps that they looked exactly the same before T changed it. That makes it pretty obvious. Whereas this, oh look, it's Milk Tea. There's another one. Die, heathen. Quick, that one's trying to escape punishment. This color combination is sacred and you will burn for this transgression. <laughs> oh damn, that one's actually stupidly accurate. Wait a minute, when was this character made? Let's see, September Kotze, one year, five days ago, June 29th, so June 22nd, 2019. We assume the date's correct and Minty was made three days before that, that would be June 19th, 2019. Saki debuted in 2018, dang! I was hoping I could make a joke about Saki being a ripoff of Milk Tea too, but I guess this just means that Milk Tea is a ripoff of Saki. Oh well. Actually, I feel like this is just the default color combination for Kuro Gyaru characters. Oh no, guys! It's a ripoff of Milk Tea and Maleficent! <laughs> at the very most, what's presented here showcases that T has a habit of looking at the characters of other artists and taking inspiration from the elements they like, which isn't necessarily stealing, and as I said earlier, basically every artist does it. Oh yeah, and the screenshots don't actually showcase the date the characters were uploaded, just the number of days it's been since upload. Since these are screenshots, there's no link to the Toy House pages and the poster's username is covered up, we can't prove that Minty, Osmond, Kai, or Milk Tea were actually made first. Beyond that, there was a list of names on Kiwi Farms that they infer were stolen by Kitty Wolf, one of T's followers, which we're on to stealing names now, are we? And that's followed up with the notion that Kitty Wolf was ripping off one of T's characters, that character effectively just being brown skin and long hair covering an eye. So like, who fucking cares at this point? These characters are so ridiculously simplistic half the time, and on top of that, everyone seems to be copying everyone else. Why are we so hyper-focused on T when apparently the artists surrounding them are all doing the very same thing? One more thing that I want to point out before we get back to the video, because, well, I couldn't believe it when I first read it, so I want to share it with all of you. So there's a game on the App Store called Lily Story. It's one of those character creators, and with the assets you can make a character that looks something like this. Doesn't seem like much of a problem until you realize that Tirza has a character that looks suspiciously like this. Have they gotten too lazy to even steal other people's characters? Why make a character that's blatantly designed using a pre-made character creator if you're never going to use them for anything? It's not like it's super special design you came up with yourself, so... I want all of that stupid to just soak in for a second. By the logic presented here, you can't use any of the combinations that can be put together using a doll maker to create a character. Any combination, I guess. Which, isn't that the point of doll makers half the time? To make up images of yourself, your friends, or your characters using the pre-made assets provided? Don't some artists specifically use doll makers with randomizers to come up with character ideas? So if you're able to use the pre-made assets to create your character, what? That means that the doll maker owns that character design? You can no longer use it? Not even just doll maker games, but any character creation game with pre-made asset. If you can combine them into a character, then you can't use that character because it was made using the pre-made assets? What if T hadn't used the egg? Would that have been fine? Or would that still be bad because you can also remove the egg in the doll maker? What if the hair was pink? Or can you do that too? I can't even. Look, maybe if egg on her face here was a character within Lily's story, then you would have a case. Because then it would actually be a character. But to infer that it's somehow bad to create a character with any of these combinations of pre-made assets is completely asinine. Oh, Oh no, I'm sorry, apparently it's not bad! I don't think using a doll maker to make an arc is really that bad tbh, but interesting point I guess. So what was the point of complaining about T using this method? Artists do this all the time! And realistically, if you were so concerned that T was stealing the characters of others, wouldn't it be a good thing if they started using doll maker games to come up with character designs instead? The poster straight up admits that they don't consider the practice to be bad, so why are they berating T for using this method or else bringing it up as though it actually proves anything? Have they gotten, Have they gotten too lazy to, lazy to even steal, steal other 
people's, people's characters. characters. Implying that this practice is somehow more lazy than taking design inspirations from others, despite T seemingly have had to create the character in the Dollmaker game using the pre-made assets, which involves more input on their end. Why make, Why a, make character a character that's blatantly, that's blatantly designed, designed using, using a pre-made pre -made character, character creator, creator if you're, if you're never, never gonna, gonna use them for anything? anything? What do you care if it's not a bad thing to do? Why is it bad for T to do this if other artists do it? Why does it matter if T is gonna use the character? character for anything. If T is supposedly stealing OCs, isn't it better that they do nothing with them? Ugh. In the meantime, Kaimurama, your single example sucks and your understanding of what constitutes stealing versus inspiration is not well defined, which isn't helped by the majority of the claims I can find regarding this being just as stupid as the rest of your video so far. If there were better examples or else more clear-cut claims, guess what should have been showcased here? Even if the character in someone's drawing didn't look like T's, if the style was similar, T would lose their shit and bombard them with messages about taking it down. When did this happen? Is this behavior that T continues with? Where's the recent evidence of this behavior? Where's any sort of dated evidence of this behavior? It doesn't make sense to punish T if this is behavior they have already made an attempt to correct or potentially have corrected. You have to show us that this is still happening. Ah yes, and that screenshot. Just adding on that, if you're an artist, you definitely want to stay away from them. They appropriate other people's art styles all the time and claim them as their own. I firsthand witnessed them doing this to one of their victims. They also did it to me on occasion, which caused me to heavily disassociate. Their main OC is also physically presented as a young child who is involved with people sexually. If you are a survivor of childhood sexual assault, definitely stay away from them. All of this evidence just feels like a game of broken telephone. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine. Oh no, I swear, I saw it with my own eyes. That last screenshot I showed you also talks about their main OC. Ash looking extremely young but works as a sex worker. Do you see the issue yet? So Kaimurama doesn't really give a lot of context here, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't necessary to showcase how the complaints and accusations to follow are ridiculous. This is the character of Ash Kinoshita, a 22-year-old 4'10 escort and college student. Please make note that the character of Ash has aged with the artist. Back in 2016, Ash was 18 and Tirza was 19, turning 20 on December 16th. The first element of note is that Ash is the primary subject featured in Tirza's work, meaning that the majority of the complaints pertaining to Tears' artwork tend to be related to either the portrayal or use of this character. The second is that Tears of themselves has gone on record to say that the character of Ash is something akin to a self-insert for them. Oh, Here, no. the term self-insert refers to an artist or writer creating a version of themselves that they put into their artwork or story. This can range from very accurate depictions to improvised or idealized versions of self. So for example, a person lacking in confidence might construct a version of themselves who doesn't suffer from that drawback. Some Someone could change their hair colors, their body type, sex, you get the idea. Whatever a person chooses to keep or change about themselves for this practice is up to them. Paired with that, it also seems to be widely understood by people talking about tea that they have identified in the past as doll kin and angel kin. Quick layman on that, kin is short for other kin and refers to a person identifying with a spirit, person, animal, or fictional character to such a degree that they may implement behaviors, visual traits, or other elements of their kin subject into their own self-expression. Honestly, it's just furries, but paranormal fantasy. So instead of foxes and wolves, you have angels and demons. Or I guess in this case, instead of fursuits, you have frilly, religiously inspired dresses. We'll talk about the concept of kinning again a little later on. Canonically, the Ash character is small, delicate, and young looking, sporting what T intends to be an androgynous look as well as the series of self-harm scars on their legs. The doll kin and angel kin elements shine through Tears' artwork in the form of depicting Ash alongside religious imagery, as well as both generally depicting the character in characteristically doll-like attire, think frilly, cutesy, Lolita fashion-esque dresses, as well as with a secondary doll form. This is essentially the character changing into the form of an animated doll, like a werewolf, but self-objectification. All right, that's probably all you need to know for now to get an idea of why I took issue with the accusations to follow. Let's continue. They draw them looking extremely young and childlike despite them being an adult. 
even if they are not canonly a child, the fact they look like a child and even has a fucking child doll form really, really concerns me. So let's break this down. The issues at hand are 1. Tirza draws a character in a childlike manner despite them being an adult. 2. That canonically adult character visually portrayed in this childlike manner is a sex worker. 3. That canonically adult character has the ability to change their form into that of a doll which looks to be much younger, 4 or 5 years old. 4. The fact that the character is portrayed like a child but not actually a child is concerning. I'm gonna give you three seconds to figure out the dumb here. One, two, three. So chibi artwork is just not allowed, huh? I'm entirely fucking serious. Look at what Kaimurama is complaining about. It's bad to draw a canonically adult character in a childlike manner. Are you serious? I mean, given that you drew this of one of your characters, really, are you serious? Are you serious? And yeah, at the time, Tirza was doing a lot of blatantly chibi-inspired art and sort of just does it every once in a while. The notion that there are other visual artistic means by which Tirza expresses and draws this character is concerning, so nobody can ever draw a chibi or cute childlike artwork of Lust from Fullmetal Alchemist. What about Haru from Beastars? Does this mean that no character who is sexualized to a degree or else has a sexual occupation or personality can ever be drawn in any sort of chibi-esque style? They can't be drawn in a childlike manner. Panty and stocking with garter belt might be in some hot water on that one then. I'm back from rocking out with my cock out. Mind you, childlike is generally used in artwork as a display of innocence, and it's not exactly like a contrast between childlike innocence and adult-oriented sexualizations or perspectives is a new concept. I mean, hell, Netflix just put out cuties and the internet got mad at them for it. I'll get you and it'll look like a bloody accident. We'll even be talking about an artist a little later on who kind of does this very same thing, which one of Kaimurama's resources said was totally okay and Tirza's artwork was blatantly worse than. And that's discounting any sort of additional artistic intentions behind the expression of the characters. I can't even fathom this mentality. Kaimurama, these things that you're talking about are not illegal, nor are they particularly morally questionable. Changing elements about a character to play into the theme or expression of a piece is a common practice. Complaining about this makes even less sense if you're aware of Tears' whole dollkin thing, which is clearly demonstrated in them portraying their self-admitted, self-insert-esque character like a doll, which yeah, tend to be small with delicate young features. The fact that Tirza constantly makes pieces like this, but that Ash even has an alternate doll form as a part of the character should make that fucking obvious. And before anyone tries to bring it up, these pieces I'm showing were drawn between 2016 and 2015, before Kaimurama made her video. If you consider these to be problems, you have to explain why they're problems, not just state that they are. And that's not even the last of the things they've done. What things they've done? All you've said is that they draw this canonically adult character in ways that make them look younger than they are. I guess forgetting that adults who look younger than they are fucking exist. Ash is their main OC and they draw them a lot. I mean, a lot. There's probably over a thousand images of this character and the worst thing is how they're drawn. See, I don't understand this complaint. The complaint is just that T draws Ash a lot. So? Seriously, what is supposed to be bad about that? And I know I'm cutting into Kaimurama's point here, and yes, Kaimurama is going to specify an element in the work that makes the sheer number of pieces something they find to be concerning, but this is actually a complaint that I've seen in a couple of other places calling T out that I've had to go over for this video. I've seen a few different instances now where people have cited that Ash is almost all that T draws, as though it's some sort of condemning trait. Yes, it means that T's work is generally less varied, but why is that particular a bad thing, outside of the argument of, well, their art won't get better. T's allowed to only draw one self-insert character if that's all they want to draw. Equally, an artist could choose to only draw portraits. Someone could choose to only paint landscapes. A person could literally redraw the same image of a potato sitting in a bucket hundreds of times, and it wouldn't matter because what the artist chooses to draw within the confines of the law is nobody else's fucking business unless they're commissioning the artist. They're drawn in hundreds of self-harm scars, bruises from their abusive relationship, and the way they're drawn hints at it being romanticized. There's always hearts, flowers, cute clothes present, and are always showing off the injuries. In my experience with self-harm, I never, ever want anyone to see the scars that I have self-inflicted, and thus I hide them. 
And yet despite saying themselves that the romanticism of self-harm is gross, they still take aesthetic pictures after cutting. As someone who self-harmed, I hide my scars and don't want people to see them. Implies that not showing off scars is a general trait common of people who self-harm. Proceeds to show images of a person who clearly does self-harm and who chooses not to hide those scars. Are you for real? Look, I'm not gonna argue that you should or should not be posting images of self-harm online. I don't want anyone self-harming, and I feel for those who have done so in the past. What I want to make a point of is that Kaimurama is bringing up their own issues with self-harm as a means of gatekeeping the issue. People with self-harm scars hide them, and thus, because Tirza doesn't hide them, their scars are less valid. That is the specific impression that I am getting from this. Having taken pictures or not, you do realize that this is still someone who is self-harming. We can see it. Tirza is in pain to some degree, and the result of that pain is being physically inflicted on their body. People don't just self-harm to this degree for the sake of doing it. This showcases something is wrong. It's still a serious issue. How Tirza copes with the aftermath of those decisions is not something you get to use to claim that they romanticize self-harm. Especially when you've just admitted that T themselves has stated that they find this practice to be gross. The fact that T chooses to draw their scars, which they physically have on their self-insert character doesn't suddenly mean that the artistic portrayal of those scars is any less valid than another person's choice to not do that. Tears of choosing to display their scars doesn't invalidate someone who chooses to hide them, and it doesn't mean that either person's pain and struggles aren't real. Frankly, unless you have some sort of means of showcasing to Tirza that posting these images in particular is not helping their mental state, you don't really get to imply negatives about the motivations behind their self-harm or choosing to post it. I'm not even going to get started on how we can't read the descriptions for these Instagram images, which is potentially suspicious given that this little blurb we can see seems to have Tirza saying, why would you fetishize and encourage something as disgusting as this? I fucking hate looking like this. God damn. I'm not even going to go into their story and character relationships. It's disgusting and I have much more important things to point out than focusing on that bullshit. Yeah, that's another thing that comes up too, that T's most frequently used or fleshed out characters are kind of disgusting, horrible people, or else they are victims of disgusting, horrible people. Which, again, just begs the question as to why this is an issue. People are allowed to create characters who are disgusting, horrible people, or victims of such. To what degree they end up successfully portraying those characters is always up for debate. But let's be real, the practice of creating edgy characters is not fucking new. Wouldn't any artist who focuses on horror or villain characters be similarly at fault for this? Although the artwork and execution of such are problematic, this doesn't even scratch the surface of things they've done. From these screenshots, they're accused of abusing their cats. Aside from these screenshots, there isn't much evidence to this, but the fact that two people have talked about the same situation in detail about the hip problems lead me to believe that it's true, although I hope it isn't true for the sole purpose that the cats are safe and cared for. Shut up. Oh yeah, let me just blatantly acknowledge that I have nothing else to support this claim of animal abuse, and the only real evidence I do have is testimony from people we can assume already don't like tea. Like, fuck off! We've already seen that M could be so far up their ass that they believe two people in a relationship, whether that had been friendship or more, I don't care, engaging in a mutual, possibly passive, possibly active exchange of artistic techniques, and M cheering them on as the changes are implemented constitutes a justification in accusing that party of copying my work, ooh-woo. Plus, Kaimurama admitted this point was dumb when B spoke to them on DeviantArt, so I somehow care even less than not at all. I've no more fucks to give, my fucks have run dry. They also happen to be in a relationship right now with someone who's extremely obsessive. One of T's OCs is named Bailey Lovell, who also happens to be an abuser to Ash. Actually, the main abuser to Ash. Their other OC. Their partner goes by Bailey and even says they kin with them. This video isn't about them, I will not be going into detail about everything, but they've also been extremely problematic, and to find out more, the links where I found all of this information will be in the description. Please continue at your own risk, there are 
intense imagery of gore and self-harm scars. Okay, so remember when I said that victim blaming was gonna come into play here? Yeah, we've gotten to that point. So the character that Kaimurama is talking about here is this guy. Bailey is canonically a shit person who outwardly portrays themselves as a soft boy, ooh, so that people don't immediately pick up on his toxic personality. He's manipulative, a stalker, entitled, he lures in women, the main subjects of his abusive intentions, by feigning a pro-feminist mentality, he is aggressive, antisocial, a sadist, and specifically targets lesbians, not not only because he views sex as a goal and therein tries to go after people who are genuinely not interested in him, but also that he seems to have a natural and sexual joy that comes from causing pain to others. Bailey is not a good person. When Kaimurama talks about Tears' significant other kidding with Bailey, what they mean is that this person has gone on record self-identifying as a character who is canonically manipulative, sadistic, and whom preys on lesbian women with insecurity. Something that should also be noted is that according to the Kiwi Farms Thread, which Kaimurama was originally setting as a resource regarding this matter, while T had engaged in self-harm to a degree on their own, this was apparently cranked up to 11 as soon as they started dating this real-life Bailey self-identifier. According to them, this is also when T started openly posting pictures showcasing their scars, fresh cuts, bruises, and injuries inflicted on them by Bailey. Do you see what I'm getting at here? And that was gleaned from Kaimurama's resources. I even went back to double check this myself and see if it was reflected in Tears' art, and it is. Early images of Ash don't have these scars. It's not until June of 2016, when T was 19, that being the earliest instances I can find of this from their DeviantArt page, that the scars started creeping into the character's design. Whether the scars were visibly present on Ash varied depending on the piece, and it seems that it wasn't until January of 2017 that the scars became a permanent addition to the character's design. So, super shocking that the scars on the character reflect the scars on the artist in real life. This is also where I take so much issue with this Tirza romanticizes abuse in their art narrative because the abuse that the character of Ash is subject to is caused by Bailey. You know, that character who is kinned by the person who is allegedly making T's self-harming significantly worse. I'm gonna be super artsy fartsy with you guys for a second, but contrast is a huge thing in art, and it could be argued Tirza is using contrast to simultaneously display the negative and harmful intentions behind manipulative relationships, as well as how it can be prettied up to look like a healthy situation. And it's not like this is even the first time T has used contrast. Almost all of their pieces featuring Ash done up like a pretty doll, but also being covered in bruises, bite marks, blood, scars, or crying contrasts the negative harmful elements of the physical injuries by literally dressing it up to look pretty. This is a possible theme behind a majority of T's character-driven pieces from what I can see. This is not a difficult concept, it's not even a new concept. Might I introduce you to the concept of Yami Kawaii or Menherake, both forms of art, the names of which translate to sick, cute, and mental healther respectively. The fashion aesthetic is similar to pastel goth and is generally framed as being cute, but with comparatively not cute elements, which can range from dangerous or medical-related accessories like syringes, gas masks, and plasters, to kink-related attire like fetish or bondage gear, to depictions of injuries or self-harm. In fact, the concept of a cute facade hiding mental health issues behind it is literally the driving theme behind Menhera-chan, the character for which menhera K is named after. Generally, the point of this style of art is to translate the pain associated with mental health issues into physical injuries that can be recognized by the general public and thus acknowledged as a real issue, rather than assuming it doesn't exist because the suffering party doesn't showcase any outward signs of illness. So with that, I'd like to offer up a huge congratulations to the artists perpetuating this interpretation of T's artwork for being so fucking stupid that they couldn't even pick up on additional themes in these art pieces. Like, really consider that. A bunch of artists looked at a series of what could effectively be self-insert vent pieces and couldn't figure out that there might be something a little deeper at play. No, instead, like laymen, they looked at it and exclusively read it literally. How about you go look at a Jackson Pollock painting and then tell me how it's romanticizing mess? This person's wearing a cute dress, but they have self-harm scars, so any sort of romanticizing must be applied to the injuries rather than any other part of the piece. Like, oh, I don't know, the whole cute aesthetic that directly contrasts and partially masks the severity of the abuse? What do you think the hearts, flowers, and uwu cutesy shit is there for? I guess romanticizing it only. I guess romanticizing the bad shit only. 
I guess only romanticizing the bad shit. There's no other potential reason. Tirza could draw a piece of a character covered in bruises and injuries, not acknowledging them and instantly trying to be sexy, and while one person could view it as romanticizing abuse, another person could see this as symbolism of a victim covering up or failing to recognize those issues. That's the crux of this entire argument, really. Kaimurama and everyone involved is arguing an interpretation of Tirza's art, not what Tirza's art factually is. Have you ever heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder? As is the very nature of art itself, a piece's interpretation and meaning changes depending on the person viewing it. But I truthfully question what part of any of these pieces is supposed to be romanticizing abuse, or even at the very least, just implying that abuse is okay. This one, where despite there being hearts, Bailey is saying that he and Ash will be together forever and Ash is looking up at him, concerned? Even there being fewer hearts around Ash could indicate that they and Bailey are not of equal affection. Or this one, where Ash is depicted as a delicate, blood-covered doll, asking that someone be gentle with them, the blood already either hinting that someone might not have been, or even that Ash is the one to be feared. Oh yes, Ash looking simply elated about Bailey in this one. It's not like the dripping hearts and spiralizing of the eyes could hint towards anything nefarious. Oh, but Tirza stole that spiral eye technique from another artist. Shut the fuck up. Tears is allowed to implement artistic techniques they see in the work of other artists if they believe it will improve their work. If somebody looks at B's art and they're like, oh, I like the purple shadows or I like the line art and they choose to incorporate it into their work, B doesn't get to be mad because they're not stealing shit, they're getting inspired by things that they see. Which everybody fucking does! Oh, look at this one, where Bailey is clearly covering Ash's mouth and speaking for them, whilst also claiming them. Oh, but because it's cute, ignore the fact that they're crying and have broken hearts in their eyes, I guess. Keep me safe, being said by Ash, who is, as we are aware, generally the victim of Bailey's abuse. Despite that, Ash still looks to Bailey for protection, something that victims of abuse tend to do with their abuser. Bailey creepily clutching a doll of Ash, simultaneously objectifying them, showcasing Bailey's obsession and demonstrating that Ash, lacking a mouth here, potentially has no voice in this situation. Oh yeah, I love it when my significant other sniffs my clothes and chants my name. That's not supposed to be unnerving or anything. Contrast piece, demonstrating Bailey being an incarnation of evil and Ash being an innocent, pure child, partially corrupted by that evil? Nah, clearly showcases that Ash is a literal child and this demon wants to get up in that. What's symbolism? I love you. I know. I love you. I know. I love you. I know. I love you. I'm scared. I don't know about you guys, but that looks like a healthy relationship if I've ever seen one. If Tirza was trying to romanticize abuse, it wouldn't make sense for them to so blatantly focus on the negative aspects of this relationship. It looks like Tirza is trying to show that it's not a good thing. Like how, oh yeah, Ash looks real pleased in this situation. I'm not kidding here. Look at almost any piece of Ash and Bailey together. Ash is never happy to be around him, whereas Bailey is ecstatic. However, this is only referring to pieces after Ash's death. There's like a whole thing where Ash died and is now back or something, and apparently the relationship between Ash and Bailey was fine before Ash died. Otherwise, after death, Ash is always frowning, looking displeased, looking concerned, but never looking happy. I don't know about you guys, but a person entering permanent I'm not okay with this face when around their significant other doesn't tend to make me think that this person is happy with the relationship, which seems like it would make romanticizing it to strangers a little harder. Mind you, this is only the work that I was getting off of T's toy house. When I was looking into claims for a different point later on, I had to browse through all of the work on T's DeviantArt from 2016, twice, and there were so many other instances where the nature of this relationship and it being detrimental to Ash was exceedingly clearly defined. How is this romanticizing abuse if the victim is so clearly not enjoying the situation? What is romantic about it if one of the parties involved is permanently displeased? This makes even less sense if you take into consideration that they are generally seeing more of the victim. We see the effects of the abuse on Ash. If Tirso's artwork is supposed to be romanticizing abuse, why don't we see any of that abuse? Yeah, weird that. In all of these images where Ash is shown to have been a victim of physical abuse, it never actually showcases the abuse happening. It's simply the aftermath. 
We don't see how Ash gets their bruises. We don't see how Ash gets their scars. We don't see how Ash breaks bones. If we're supposed to be reading everything else literally here, then since these images showcase more of the aftermath or possessive phrases, then isn't it only romanticizing injury and obsession? Much like the contrast of the cute aesthetic potentially masking nefarious motives, all of the physical abuse goes on behind the scenes, and we, the audience, are privy to none of it. We are only shown hints of it through what the characters say, how they interact with each other, and surprise, surprise, the bruises and scars. If someone draws a cute soldier character constantly sporting the wounds and damage from combat, but never engaging in combat itself, you wouldn't say that they were romanticizing war. Equally, if you have a character who demonstrates negative visual signs of depression or anxiety, are you going to say that they are glorifying them? Actually, yeah, isn't that effectively along the same lines? It's a negative situation that people can be victims of that tends to be hidden behind the facade of a smiling face while the person is being both physically and mentally broken down, just from different sources. But I'm not seeing artists drawing melancholy pieces of depressed characters trying to act happy be put on blast for romanticizing depression or glorifying hiding mental illness, so what the actual hell makes Tears' art so nefarious? In Tears' art, the focus is never on the abuse itself, it's always on how Ash is posed while openly visually showcasing the physical signs of that abuse. A focus on visualizing the aftermath of horrible events doesn't by default validate those events nor justify the initial act of committing them. And if you think I'm wrong, then fucking show it! Hell, I could be entirely wrong. Maybe it's completely Tears' intent to romanticize abuse with their pieces, and Kaimurama is reading exactly into that intended message. That being said, it's still not your issue, and it's still not something that Tirza would have to change about their artwork. In the same vein as I've already discussed where an artist can draw the same thing over and over if they like, they can also choose to portray themes or concepts in both negative and positive lights of varying intensities and combinations, provided it's within the boundaries of the law. That's how art works. And guess what isn't against the law? Which leads me into my climax for this section, and some of you might have already guessed it given that I've discussed this issue in the past. Kaimurama and others of this mentality are dissatisfied with there being elements of an abusive relationship present in Tirza's artwork. The character that is at the center focus and victim of that abuse is a self-insert or else artistic visual symbol based on the artist themselves. To such a degree that as the artist engaged further in self-harming behavior, the character's design would then reflect those injuries and T's significant other, Kins, with a character who is the canonical abuser of T's self-insert. And one of the forums Kaimurama indicated they used as a resource specifies on the first page that Bailey is potentially doing some sort of harm to T, at the very least to such a degree that their self-harming issues seem to have significantly worsened, implying that Bailey could either be encouraging T's self-harm, exploiting it, or else exacerbating their anxiety so much that T has increased self-harming on their own as a means of dealing with it. What I'm getting at here is that it very much looks like Kaimurama and the other idiots attached to this are blaming a potential victim of abuse for being a victim of abuse, and they're in having that abuse show up as a theme in their emotionally driven self-insert artwork. Yeah, victim blaming, you morons. Oh, but T's an abuser too. I don't fucking care. That's not what Kaimurama's talking about here, and that doesn't change the fact that a shit person can still be a victim of abuse. In fact, a victim of abuse can turn into a shit person. That's how it tends to work. Kaimurama has been expressly saying that T's artwork shows aspects of abuse, and that's bad, completely ignoring why that abuse might be there in the first place. Granted, I am in no way directly making the claim that T is or has ever been physically abused by their significant other. For all we know, they could be in a perfectly healthy, loving relationship. We simply don't know because the tiny facets of T's life you can view over the internet don't give a clear enough picture of their life as a whole. I am simply stating that these are the elements present in their work, and while there could be many reasons for this presence, Kaimurama is exclusively focusing on how they perceive the artwork, or how others have perceived the work, and then relayed that perception to Kaimurama. 
which is stupid. We don't really need to go over the last minute and a half of Kamarama's video. It mostly just reiterates, I didn't want to get involved, but my friends had their character stolen and I had to do something. And we already know how I view the whole character theft argument as a whole. So instead, we're gonna take a break and then hop on over to Kamarama's second video, responding to questions on my Dolly Guts video, where hopefully she can provide us with some sort of reasonable justification as to why this video had been kept up for so long. Because as you've seen, it's not particularly good. Well, that whole thing was a mess. Not exactly sure how vouching for testimony when you have no idea where it came from became popular, but it should probably stop. Also claiming that perusing a gossip forum is hard research. And yes, as I'm sure people have noticed and questioned the Avatar clothing choice, this video was originally supposed to be out in October. But you know, 2020 has been a thing, priority shift, and I'm not really gonna expect my editors to make exceptions in their own life to put together these videos. We can all just blame Kaimurama for not doing her due diligence in the first place. And then again when the issues were pointed out to her. Get excited for part two, where we'll be diving even deeper into this hellhole. And before we move on to enjoy some amazing art for anyone wanting to submit fan art of any of my characters, you can can now do that by sending it to EmptyComicsFanArt at Outlook.com. Since this is a new thing, I'm going to finish my collection of fan art that people have already tagged me in up until December 31st of 2020. And that's going to be on all of my, uh, all of my accounts. I'm going to try really hard to get it done. So please know that beyond that point, I'll only be featuring fan art that is sent to me through that email, as sometimes people don't want their fan art to be in the feature and I want to respect that. So as of December 31st, all fan art people want to appear in the fan art feature one day must be sent to EmptyComicsFanArt at Outlook.com. If you have already tagged me as of December 31st, you don't need to send it. I'll collect all of that stuff on my own. Also, preferably a link where you want to be credited because sometimes people change usernames or switch accounts or something, and sometimes my links don't work or I can't find the accounts of the people the work is credited to when I save it, and then I don't know what to do. So. Yeah, it's just way less stressful and more streamlined that way. So uh, send your amazing artwork to EmptyComicsFanArt at Outlook.com and let me know where you'd like to direct people who want to see more of what you create. That clear to everyone? Cool. Okay, now for some cute fan art to lighten the mood. First up, we've got a chill but ready to battle pose in Pokemon Trainer Ponder Sprocket by James Segoy, where Fiend is a breath locked and the duo is ready to do some water psychic damage, which is oddly fitting, but I like the illusion of there still being punching involved. Swinging in to save the day, here's Octomama Spider Sona by Vanilla the Neko, who's created the alternate universe where Doc Ock and Spider Man are the same person? It's a spider puss. Wap wap. Thwip thwip. I don't need snapping, what am I doing? Prep for some more alternate design fun, it's Succubus Ponder Sprocket by Dragcura the Dragon. Posed like a queen and showing off her lovely wings and tail that Dragcura made, the cute little Octobuddy and boots. Wow, I love those boots on her, goddamn. Shooting in as a blast from the past, we've got Kinks by Stupid Cupid TWTS, where I guess Ponder Sprocket is going to show Deviant Cringe what BDSM is. Maybe that's Tirza's problem. They just need to focus more on BDSM content and then the bruises won't matter. Sorry, boy, but the WAP goblin's in town. Ready to dash away your dreams, here's Ponder Sprocket by Terra Conceptual Art, throwing out proof and truth like it's nothing, a wave of her hand, a fist on a hip, and this artwork shall make false evidence disappear. <laughs> it was a little too flashy, but I'll take it. Giving us a better inkling of an idea behind its meaning, here's Drawing Idols as Squids by Cozy Rhea one Not only highlighting how easy it would be to style your hair if you could move it around independently, but also forever reminding us that Fiend is a good boy. Because oh my gosh, look at the brushes, obviously be baby! Next, we're memed with Ah Shit, Ponder at it again by Cerberus the Terrible, which, why is this so accurate? Why must this vibe make me want to punch a wall? At least I can be delighted at how adorable Fiend and Ponder Sprocket look in this piece because that chunky style is perf. Getting across its message with simplicity, we have Ponder as the Queen by Wendy BFF underscore one. I get a very I'm so sick of your shenanigans vibe overall. Pretty nicely accented with the yellow against the red and burgundy. It's very minimal, but the colors still pop out at you nicely. Just about ready to burst, we have Lewd from a speed paint by Edgelord, but I'm going to credit it from Whistle While You Work, since that's the Instagram she puts her work on, because this fan art is two years old, and if you think this is cute, her work's just gotten cuter. Plus, I wanted to highlight how amazing two years of hard 
hard work can evolve someone's art. Riding in on the wave, it's Ponder Sprocket Smashes Into the Competition by Fushiu Ningyo. I really hope I said that right this time. Ready to whip out that stack of evidence at a moment's notice. I'm afraid that I must point out that Fushiu also made this. Hmm, bit of a sticky wicket we've gotten our chromatophores into there, old chap. Yes, yes, quite right, pish posh and all that. Styled for success and here to protect, here's Octomama by Pon Pon Kitty Cat with some cool colored line art and some really cute heart highlights to convey an explanatory Octomama with a sweet cephalopod to boot. Explanatory? Is that a word? I'm not sure if that's a word. I'm not looking it up. It's so neat seeing the different things that people can do with lighting and I absolutely love the texturing you did on Fiend. And we'll end off the evening with Trick or Treating by Flora Night 1999, featuring the names Junkie the Durgan, Dulu the Twitchy Witchy Portal Hopper, Alice, Icy Hazard's Carnally Chaotic Clown, My Weird Watery Self, A Proud Queen Ponder, Phagos the Spooky Boy, and the Master of the Mayhem themselves, A Freaky Face Off by Flora Knight. I think we could all use a little whimsical spookies, not just so that we can indulge in some fine, fun, and fanciful spooky season artwork, but also so we can laugh at my inability to get a video out when I plan it. Haha, -ha, we all come full circle. Also a big thanks to my editors, links to all of them and their content so y'all have more stuff to enjoy. If you like any of these pieces, please don't hesitate to give the artist some love through the links I have provided down in the description. My links are also down there if you're so inclined. And with that, Optimama out. <laughs>